Um, welcome everybody. I'm Joan Brzezinski and I am direct the University of Minnesota China Center. We're pleased that you joined us today for our con center, or China Center's Considering China webinar. Um, and I thank you also for your support of the China Center and this webinar series. Your time and generosity help make programs like this possible. Um, we are particularly grateful to Kai Mei and Joseph Terry for the generous support of this program, and we invite you to help us advance our mission and give to the China Center through the link on the webinar announcement or on our website. I will now turn the program over to Haiyan Wang, who is Assistant Director here at the China Center. Haiyan. Thanks, Joan. Um, can you see me? Okay, my name is Haiyan. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Um, Stephanie In is the founder and president of New York Institute of Go. Stephanie is a professional 1P Go player. She became professional at the age of 16 and has won multiple US Go tournaments. Stephanie is also an experienced Go teacher who is fluent in English and Chinese. Stephanie led NYIT's organization and supported several international and national Go events. She was a main commentator in the Google DeepMind team for the Kejie versus AlphaGo matches in the Future of Go Summit in 2017. And Stephanie served as the vice president in the American Go Association in 2019. Ryan Lee is a professional Go player in the North American Go Federation. He is known, uh, he is a Go teacher and influencer. Ryan is known as the only Western affiliated professional who defeated a world champion and a two time champion of the transatlantic professional Go League. He received his PhD in climate physics from Yale University and authored several publications in atmospheric sciences and the climate change. Ryan's currently a machine learning engineer at Amazon. Now, without further ado, Let's welcome our speakers, Stephanie and Ryan. And should we start right now? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie. Thank the University of Minnesota China Center for inviting me and Ryan to share our stories about Go with you. So the game of Go originated in China over 2,500 years ago. It is the oldest board game. The earliest record found was from Confucius, Lun Yu. It is a collection of saying and ideas from Confucius written by his students. There are different interpretations from the current scholars who are from different backgrounds. In this sentence, Confucius is expressing a philosophy to his students. In order to be a successful person, you have to avoid laziness. You should always have your own thoughts and produce ideas on your um, different things. Playing Go games require your own strategy. It is already better than have nothing in mind. Go is one of the four arts of Chinese scholar. Qing Qi Shu Hua. Qing Gu Qing is stringed instrument, and Qi is Go. Shu is Chinese calligraphy, and Hua is Chinese painting. After Go record, uh, after Go record was founded from Confucius, Shi Ben, the earliest Chinese encyclopedia that recorded imperial genealogies during the spring and autumn period. Says Yao Emperor created Go and taught his son Dan Zhu in order to in enlighten his intelligence, teach him patience and focus. And during, during, uh, during Wei and Jin dynasty, Go became popular. It is not only a favorite game among scholars, but royal relatives. Go ranks have been developed and many Go events were hosted. This is written in the history of the Southern dynasties. The Emperor Wu of Liang likes playing Go. He requires his national champion to evaluate other people's level. 
the total registered people were 278. And during that period, Go started to popularizing in Korea. Tang and Song dynasties were historical periods of Go development. The Qi Dai Zhao has been established. It is, a, it is official royal position for selecting the strongest Go players for emperors. Go was spread in Japan during the Tang dynasty. And during Ming and Qing dynasties, more professional players were promoted. Strong players started teaching people and having different styles of playing. And Go was introduced to the West in the 16th century, but became popular until 19th century. By the early 20th century, Go has spread throughout the German and Austro-Hungarian empires. Edward Lasker, the founder of the American Go Association, learned Go in Berlin, published his book, Go and Go Muku in 1934 and helped spread the Go throughout the US. Because the long history of Go, it has innumerable stories and legends. Many literature refer to Go as Lan Ke. It is most introduced for Go story. So now it's a story time. The story of Lan Ke is Wang is a farmer who climbed a mountain to gather firewood. On uh, his Yuru route, he is attracted by the sound of stones touching a board, leading him through a cave to an opening where he sees two elders playing Go. He sets his equipment aside and begins to watch them play. After the game is finished, one player says to Wang, are you going to leave? One realizes that he had forgotten all about the purpose of the trip, but when he picked up his ax, the handle was sudden and the head was rusted. Once he returned to his village, no one re really recognized him. Decades have passed. Lanke became expression for someone focusing something so intently only to realize afterwards that a long period of time has passed. It is a story about Moto watching Imoto's play go, where it was believed that one day in the sky, one year on the earth. This is how go was introduced to me. My father is a big fan of go. My parents wanted me to have a longer attention span, be patient, and never give up on things that I already pursue. So this is the Go game. Two players take a black and white stones and place the stones on their intersection points. Go is a building. Whoever has the most territory wins. Go is easy, but hard. It only has three rules, but requires creativity and leadership. All stones are equal before it is placed on the board. Once a stone is placed, the value of the stones may change. The role of a stone may also change at a different stage of the game. A stone can be attacker or a defender at different moment. And goal players are the leader. Having a whole board create creative plan and using different stones efficiently is the most important. There is an old saying, the styles you play in Go reflects your true personality. Everyone has a different personality and strategies. That's why there has never been a duplicate game since Go was invented. So now Ryan is going to talk about history first. Um, yep. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, High End for the introduction and also Stephanie for um, uh, the, the intro to go. And also, of course, for having me here as a speaker. Um, so, yeah, today I will talk a little bit about my personal experiences um, growing up with go um, and as well as some of the modern developments of go afterwards. So similar to Stephanie, my uh, father was a very big Go enthusiast. He would um, not 
feel right if you didn't play a few games of Go every day. And so that's how I was exposed to it. So this is a photo of him playing a, a game with me. Um, I believe I was about six at the time. Um, you can see, also see the, we were home and I actually have a lot of toys um, in the background. Now, growing up with Go is, was a little bit difficult for me um, in Canada because when we moved there, uh, I was still in elementary school. But you could probably imagine it's 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 pretty hard to explain um, uh, Go to to someone, right? Um, because if if you've never heard about the game before, it just seems like a very complicated game. So it was it was hard to um, show the game to other people and talk about it with with my friends um, because they didn't really know about it. And that was a little difficult for me because I really liked playing Go. It's actually um, one of the few hobbies that I actually really enjoyed. Um, and so I had really a lot of trouble tr um, keeping it going. So um, can, can you please go back? Yeah, um, yeah so I think the, the biggest thing that I've carried over from Kind of growing up with Go is really the the fact that the, how persistence and resilience works, um, and at the time when you're when you're little, it's really hard to keep it up if no one else is doing it. So my parents had a played a big role in that. But after now, when I reflect back and think about it, um, their uh, their efforts was was very rewarding. Now, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so it was rewarding because when I went to high school, um, uh, it was a it was a slightly different environment. But one day, um, one of my friends who also played Go, but that but I didn't know about, um, so he was just some other student in the class. Now he he some uh, one day he just suddenly um, looks to the right, and I was sitting beside him, and he just asked, um, "Hey, do you?" know how to play this game called Go. And then I was really surprised because at the time I I had continued to play Go, but I never had um, anyone to anyone close to me that I played against. So I, of course I said yes. I was I was I was shocked, but I was very pleasantly surprised. And so we booked a time to to play Go uh, in the school cafeteria. So it was just us two. Um, he had go set, so he's like, "Oh, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring a, a set tomorrow, um, and let's meet at the cafeteria." And so that's what we did, and um, it was it was really interesting because at the time, you know, I I learned go when I was really really young, and I kept practicing myself, um, practicing online and reading books, uh, kind of just on my own time and monitored by my by my parents, and and in I had an online presence, meaning I was actually decently strong online. So I was really, really confident that, you know, some, some guy in school, I can definitely win, right? But to my surprise, he was really, really strong. And I lost my first game. And I was like, wait, who is this guy? And why is he so good? Right? So after that, I was, I couldn't, I couldn't um, bear it. I had to re-challenge him. And I, and I challenged him to a rematch. And we kept playing. Um, I won the second game. And then we kept playing. And by the time when we finished, we had played several games and it was actually, it, the, the sky was getting dark. Um, and we had a, actually a few people come around and ask us and, and some of them knew about the game and they were watching. So that experience really um, inspired me to, to my, inspired my enthusiasm in the game. Not only like it's, it's a really good way to make friends, actually the, 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 the guy who I played with, uh, I'm still very close friends uh, with him now and, uh, and, and we still keep in touch very frequently. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very easy way for, for two people who don't know each other, very different backgrounds to kind of just um, can have, have a conversation that's not in words, but using strategies on the board and you can have many back and forths and many interactions. 
So after that, um, we started a go club actually in our high school and we kept it running uh, until we graduated. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so I think the biggest gain that I've received from Go was actually most of its passive benefits. Um, if you tell someone, oh, why do you learn Go or why should you? Um, it doesn't really do anything directly, right? As, as any hobby, you shouldn't do it just because, you know, it's going to directly be good for you for something, right? At, at least it's, in my opinion, that's not a very healthy hobby to, to have. Um, so, but I think that Go is a hobby that really helped me strengthen my character. Um, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, um, to play a game of Go, you need really strong endurance and you need to be patient and you need to focus for long periods of time. And I believe that, that those traits um, tr really translated and allowed me to succeed um, academically. So um, when I went to Yale, um, I noticed that a lot of the traits that um, I learned in Go um, really helped me a lot during my academic studies. Uh, next slide, please. And I think by far, personally, the most important thing I've ever learned from Go was that you should never lose something before you even try. Um, and frequently when we think about something that we're not very familiar with, the first reaction is commonly that, oh, it's, it looks pretty hard or, oh, it's probably not for me or I'm not very good at it, right? Now, that sort of mentality is common to cause you to fail immediately at, at doing something before you even do it, right? You have a mentality that you're not good enough or it's probably not going to succeed. Um, and I really learned this lesson um, when I was playing in one of the international Go tournaments. Um, so in this picture, I, uh, so I'm, I'm on the right and um, right across from me, he is a, one of the most famous Go players um, in the world. And I knew I was going up against him. So I almost lost the game before going, before even playing the game because I found out that I was playing him and I knew that he was much stronger with much more experience and, and, and uh, skill. But after kind of adjusting, um, well, actually Stephanie played a pretty big role in that because she was the one who, who told me not to lose the game before you even start. And I tried very hard to adjust my mentality, to, to change it in a way, to, to not to, to, to convince myself that I I'm just playing a game, right? It's just a regular game. I should just play it um, using my skills and not worry about that. And to my surprise, I actually won that game. And that turned out to be uh, one of my biggest Go achievements. So I think that's one of the biggest things that Go has ever taught me is that you should never uh, give up on something, anything, without even attempting it. Um, that's the easiest way to lose. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So. Um, Oh, I, sorry, one more. Yeah, so yeah, um, Go to me has had a very big impact. Um, now I'm gonna go into a little bit about the influence of the game uh, in our modern society. So, um, and a lot of you probably know where I'm going with this. So I'm gonna start with the, the, the mystery of Go. And this is uh, actually a, a, a book called um, A Mystery of Go, written by a, cryptog uh, a cryptologist, um, I.J. Good. Now, this name might not be familiar to you, but if, if you watch the imitation game, um, he's actually the character on the right there, uh, or the actor is playing uh, I.J. Good. So um, the reason why this author knew about the book was because of uh, computer scientist Alan Turing was actually a Go aficionado who introduced Go to many of his colleagues while he was working. And so he actually what played a big role in terms of uh, making more people know about Go in, in Europe. Uh, next slide, please. So what I J Good wrote in that book was that, so at the time they were, they were already thinking about, they were already developing the, the concepts in com of computer science. And, um, 
here's what the, their thoughts at the time, right? So they knew about the game. And, but, but uh, in the quote, he mentions that Go must be so hard to program because a lot of the principles are very qualitative and, and they're very mysterious. And, and at the time there were already um, Go programs in chess, although they're not uh, the best yet, but they, were, they already existed. So he was speculating that Go must be uh, a much bigger challenge um, uh, in, in a very big grand challenge of, of computer science. So, and that's true. So Go has been long recognized as a, one of the biggest challenges in the field of artificial intelligence and much more difficult to solve uh, than chess. Next slide, please. Yeah, so why is Go so hard? Now, if we just have two numbers to compare with, the number of chess positions, which is often quoted to be, sorry, I think the, these two numbers are swapped. Um, I apologize. So the number of chess positions is about 10 to the 46. So 10 with one with 46 zeros afterwards. Now the total number of atoms in the observable universe is 10 to the 80. Um, if you go, if we look at the very, the Go positions, that is a astronomically bigger number um, than the two previous ones. So to, in perspective, if you start a new chess game, uh, the white player has 20 possible moves, right? You can move any of the pawns. And black also has 20 possible moves. So after two moves, there are 400 total possible board positions because it's 20 times 20. Um, if you think about Go though, you start with an empty 19 by 19 board. So if you, so just when you start, Black has already 361 possible moves. You can play anywhere in any of the intersections on the board. Now, the next move is White's turn and White can follow with 316. So if you multiply those two numbers, you, you already get a huge number just after the, the first two moves have been played. So that should give you some uh, basic perspective on the complexity in the game. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so then came the, the, the AlphaGo. Now, AlphaGo was developed by DeepMind. And in March, 2016, DeepMind uh, publicly challenged the best Go player in the world, um, who is Lee Sedol from South Korea, against their artificial intelligence program. And so uh, in the picture here, you see uh, Lee Sedo, who is the, the top Go player on the right side. He's playing his first move there uh, as Black. And on the left, that's Dr. Aja Huang, who uh, played a big role in the development of AlphaGo. So when we, when the Go community heard about this, it, people thought, a lot of people thought it was, it was ridiculous because um, it was considered, you know, the, the best Go programs were much weaker than the top human players by, by uh, multiple stones. And so many, many believe that it was impossible and it must take decades to achieve. So when, when people thought, heard about this challenge, they thought, oh, they're just um, doing one of those challenges again, right? But to everyone's surprise, um, next slide, please. It, they really shocked the world. Oh, sorry, one more. Um, and because the best player in the world was defeated in the best of five series. And, and he only won one of the five games. So they put a million dollar prize for on the best of five series and AlphaGo won actually four to one. And interestingly, the game that Lisa Do won actually became one of the most famous games probably in the history of man versus machine games. Next slide, please. So AlphaGo was very, was revolutionary because um, it was the first program to use a new technique. Um, the program uh, actually scaled very well with more and more computer power um, with develop, uh, development of computers. But the reason why it was so special was because its Go's complexity was so high that it really forced programs to actually go much beyond. It, it really forced programs to, to take a step up. Because when, when the chess AIs first defeated humans, they were using more or less what, what is called a brute force method, meaning that they just tried, uh, it, it, they just more or less tried a, a bunch of methods, a bunch of moves and go to the end, see who wins. So it, was, it wasn't really any, it wasn't really revolutionary because they were just trying different combinations in, in smart ways to see which one worked. But the Go AI was not, it actually, showed uh, that it learned 
um, as, as it played more games. Next, please. Yeah, so the AlphaGo actually turned, had a very huge impact on us because it turned into a general algorithm at getting good at anything quickly. So as um, DeepMind uh, developed it, they actually was able to make it into just a general learning um, program. You don't even have to tell it what the rules are. Um, you can, you all you have to do is have it play games and eventually it will actually start learning what the rules are. So um, this actually has a lot of uh, applications and are currently uh, using, they're currently using it to address a lot of the major issues that we have um, in, in the society as a whole. Next slide, please. Yeah. So what I'd like to tie this back to is really the secret is very simple. The, the heart and novelty of this Go AI is actually really, really simple. In essence, what is it doing? It's just thinking about the move. So a skill that we say in Go is that we read through the game, meaning we try to predict what would happen in the future by not actually playing it yet. Um, and that's really it. So it thinks about the moves, it tries to consider what the opponent might do, and it tries to choose a, a good promising path. Next, please. So, and then what do you have to do? Well, you have to evaluate the position, right? So if I do that, would the state be good for me, right? So it tries to evaluate, um, is that a good place to be? And is, is that result good? And of course we would think back now, if you go uh, next please, then we would think back and choose the best one based on one and two, right? If you think about some possibilities and you try to evaluate them, then you extract what you think is the best. Of course, as you become a stronger Go player, um, the, by definition, you're you're able to, to find better moves and you're also able to evaluate the positions better. Next, please. And finally, what do you do, right? After you play game, you win or you lose, and then you go back and think about what happened in that game, right? You think about what you judged correctly or incorrectly, and you try to improve your skills one and two, so that in the next game, you make better judgments. And that's it, four steps. Uh, next, please. And this is how Go players have been learning the game for thousands of years. Uh, next, yeah. So this is my final slide. Now, I, I like to tie this back to like, you know, the, the long history of Go and we've, the, the, the human society has known this game for thousands of years. And because we, in history, we have it recorded, right? So really we're taking this millennia of wisdom and we're passing it on. And so I'm not gonna go into the, the, the list here in, in the interest of time, but these are all the very important um, benefits of learning Go. Um, and with that, I will pass it back to Stephanie who will introduce some of her experiences. Great, thank you, Ryan. So after one year of learning Go, I defeated all Go player, girl players in my home city and I won the 2008 city elementary school tournament. And then my life has changed. Because my teacher suggested to my parents that I should go for the path of being a professional. So at the age of nine, I left my hometown long and came to Beijing, which is the capital of China and where you can get the best training. I was enrolled in a professional go school. There are around 100 students who are around my age and are determined to become a pro. We had a very strict schedule, starting from 6.20 a.m. in the morning until that time, 9.30 p.m. Two major long vacations, and one month for Chinese New Year, and two months for summer break. Other than that, we couldn't be absent from our regular school study or go class, but our parents could visit us. So I missed my parents and the family so much at the beginning. Fortunately, all of the school teachers were able to 
understand you and able to calm you down. So I started liking the school and get used to it. So at the same time, my goal skill improved very fast. Well, however, that luck came to me. I was waiting for lunch in front of the food window and the cook was holding a giant pot of hot soup and tripped himself. Then the whole pot of soup sprinkled on me and I got burned and couldn't get up the bed for three months. Then my parents took me back to my hometown. So I haven't, I have never forgotten what my dream was. Now, after one, year, one and a half years, I begged my parents again to let me go back and continue pursuing my professional dream. There are 1,000 to 1,200 professional go players in the world. The 2002 was my first time to participate in a professional qualification tournament. People also like to call it go gaka. So how do people become, become a pro? The system has changed a little bit nowadays, but at the time, only 20 youth players were able to be promoted. And two girls and 18 boys with age requirements. The 20 years old or younger for girls and 17 years old or younger for boys. So due to the competitive, the, due to the intense competitive, most of the kids had to give up their regular school studies instead of having a full-time go training in Daochang, means professional go school. So it is, it is believed that if you don't make any progress, that means you regress because everyone else is improving. The time is precious. And after four years learning in a Daochang, in 2006, I became one of the strongest female players to be qualified as a pro. However, I was third place, but only the top two can be promoted to a pro. So one step away from qualifying, becoming pro was close yet but so far. And I vividly remember silence in the next weeks of my life, all hope seems lost. However, my father felt everything that I felt but hold everything in, inside of him and did not say a word. He always stood beside me. Giving up was not in the equation. Learning Go has taught me no game has a 100% winning rate. There will always be obstacles. Always get up wherever you fall. In 2007, I was turning to the age of high school. If I don't succeed in Go, I would have nothing. So my parents decided to enroll me in a regular high school and studied in a Daochang in the afternoon and night. It was my last chance. The hard work pays off. I won all of my tournament games in a professional qualification tournament. And finally, I opened that door. In 2010, I told my parents that I wanted to experience a different world. If I missed the age for college, I would never have that chance to have it. But I truly knew what it means. Going to a different country alone, everything will have to start from zero again. So everything was extremely difficult for me, mainly because of the language. But past Go learning experience made me move forward. I found a new understanding of life. So in the past, I thought being a Go professional was to compete and to win tournaments. However, attending many Go events in the US made me realize there is a bigger obligation for being a pro, which is to promote and teach Go. There are so many Go players who are eager to learn and improve, but they couldn't find teachers and learning opportunities. So the US Go Congress, biggest event in North America, the first collegiate Go Expo was held at Harvard University. And I started teaching and promoting Go to all ages and all levels. New York Go Center was the gathering place for 
all New York Go players, but unfortunately closed in 2010 due to financial difficulties. Players, I still remember, players teared and wished for the day to reopen. So on that day, I made up my mind. I have to bring the place back for Go players. Then the New York Institute of Go was established in 2016 and the headquarters moved to the Midtown Manhattan in 2021. In 2017, a historical moment, which is the human world champion was defeated by artificial intelligence, Google AlphaGo. Go was widely introduced into the Western countries. So in 2019, I joined the American Go Association. I wanted to try my best effort to make more people know and, and like the game of Go. These were the events I have taught in the past, but I believe there will be more and more in the future. So our, our mission is to communicate and prolong Go spirit and Go philosophy, popularizing Go in North America, providing Go education to students of all ages. So with commitment in mind and inheritance from generation to generation, the game of Go will be one of the most popular board games in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie and Ryan. This is amazing. Yeah, I really enjoyed your presentation. I myself am a Go lover because, but, but I, I don't play very well, but I also have a nine year old who plays Go. She practiced every day. And then I relate a lot when Ryan was talking about his experience coming to North America, coming to the elementary school, but all the friends don't had, had no idea about what Go is. So uh, do you have any advice to kids learning Go in North America? Yes. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And um, it's, a downside of for for a game that's like not as popular, um, which is one of the reasons why we're on the initiative to get more and more people to know about the game. I think for students in schools that are trying to keep it up, I think the the parents do have to exert a pretty strong effort because for for children, um, they also don't really have judgment of what's good or not and they sometimes realize later that oh I should have kept it going and um there are some resources um to start clubs um even I think at middle school level um uh which um I think the American Go Foundation they offer um support to start Go activities in in schools um, so I think that's a good way. Um, there's also a pretty big uh, online presence if it's harder to get local um, players. Um, so there are um, a lot of good ways to kind of join the online community and also attend the in-person events. Um, so there's an annual, there are, there are quite a few um, annual Go events in the US. Um, so that could be a good, um, thing to look forward to for 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 kids to 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 join. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm looking at uh, questions from the audience. So one of the audience was asking, how can they take uh, Go classes from um, Ying Lao Shi? I see you answered that already, but I'll post the web link on the chat box so that everyone can see. Also, um, I do have another question. Um, that's also for Ryan, I think. So you are you are famous because you defeated the two time world champion Chen Yaoye. Um, so um, before time, it's considered really nearly impossible for like Western affiliated Go player to defeat Asian Go pros. Then in the future, with the, the help of AI, what do you? think of the future of the American Go players? 
yeah um yeah so another very good question so um so yeah so first of all the, the win is i think it's it was quite lucky um i it was the the win that i had against the world champion um i think in general though the the second part of the question is more about um how uh how the ai has impacted go learning um I think in a lot of ways for high level players, it has brought players closer in strength. Um, so I think that because with AIs, they they can they allow you to explore um, the game much easier. Um, so it's it's like a, almost like a learning utility that's very easily accessible to everyone. However, its impact on the the most the other players, or I guess the 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 greater Go community, is actually very limited, because AIs can't really teach the game; they they only have the answer. So it's the analogy I like to make is it's sort of like um, just having a a, a book um, with all the answers to all your math questions, and that's not very useful because it doesn't really show you how to arrive at the answer. Um, so I think that uh, while it's very impactful on the stronger players in Go players, um, AIs don't really affect um, most Go players, let's say. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, here's a question from the audience. Do you have a pattern in mind at the start of game? Uh, Stephanie, do you want to take this? Oh, I think someone's asking to stop sharing. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. Stop sharing. Okay. Stephanie, do you want to answer that question? Do you have a pattern in mind at the start of the game? Pattern? Mm, yeah, I, the answer is yes. Um, so usually we'll have to have um, the plan before uh, we, we start the game. Um, like, um, so Go has a, has a different uh, styles and strategies, then we will have to decide which strategies and the plan to, to play in this game. Because once you start, and you, you can't really change the whole strategy. Okay. So um, I have um, another question from myself. So if you have to explain Go to another person here who has no idea about this game, let's say a one minute elevator pitch. So you have to explain this Go game to this person in very short period of time, like 30 seconds. What would you say? What do you say? Why, why is Go cool? What is this game? Why should you do that? Um, so I think that, yeah, it's, it's a, I think the elevator question is, is very hard for, for, especially for Go, because first of all, not many people have heard of it. Um, so if I were to meet my boss in the elevator and I had 30 seconds, <laughs> I would try to focus on not what, Go is and how to play, but but try to focus on like um, a couple of things that we mentioned um, is sort of like uh, so like why why would it benefit right so Go had a huge impact on the society as a whole because Go inspired machine learning and and was used to to conquer a, a very big problem that led to a huge breakthrough um, and also the the really the the, the, the strengthening of the character, almost, um, when you play Go, you had to face losses, you have to, you have to learn how to overcome defeat. And um, so it really strengthens you overall as a person. Okay, great. Um, here's a question for Stephanie. If you decide your strategy before the game begins, how do you know which to select? Is it based on mood? what you know about your opponent? Um, 
Well, if, if it's the first time to play um, a person that I don't know, I, I can't tell. <laughs> but what I can uh, make a decision is um, I will have to have my own strategy. But after playing, so Go has a three-stage opening, mid game, and end game. So after the opening started, I the both players should know each other's strategy already, like the style, whether you're attacking style or territorial style. And then being a balanced player is, the, is very important. So you can very easily uh, switch between territorial style or, or attacking style. So that, that's really my plan for playing the tournament. So if I know, oh, this is a, my opponent's attacking style, then if I'm, a, if I'm taking advantage, then I will continue it. If I'm, not, if I'm in a disadvantage situation, then it's still very easily for me to switch to another style. Thank you. Um, for both of you, can you share any blunder you made when you play the game? How do you deal with it after you made a huge mistake in a game? How do you deal with any huge mistake in life? <laughs> it's the same way. So I think Go has a lot of analogies with with real life and and because like just like a lot of the decisions like when you play a move you can't take it back right that's a simplest analogy when you when you've done something wrong you can't you can't just undo it uh, like in your word document so um yeah i think like for in the context of just go right um your goal is to try to maximize your chance of winning right you play a move your opponent plays a move. so you have to try and somehow make it back right you know you made a mistake now you have to do more to, to overcome it in, in other places um, or in different ways. So um, yeah, I really like, the, so when I was learning Go, I always, my teachers always um, made analogies to real life. And so like, for example, when you make a huge mistake in real life, what would be the best way to, to address it, right? Um, you have to see what, what the mistake affects and you have to fix those. And then you also have to review and make sure you don't do the same thing again. That's nice. Stephanie, do you have anything to share? Yeah, on the top of that, um, um, I think in making a huge mistake in, in, in a game, in a Go game, is not the end of the world because uh, Go game has uh, different stages. So everybody makes a mistake. Um, and then when I was learning in the Go school, my teacher, uh, who is a nine time professional, always give us an example. Go is not competing whoever not making mistake. It's competing whoever makes the last mistake. But a lot of people, like, if, we, um, if we make mistake and then get very emotionally, it's very hard to continue the game. But that's why learning Go will also uh, teaches us how to control our, ourselves and uh, be rational. So even though we made a mistake, then it's still, there's a lot of chances to catch back. Then we can calm down and waiting for chances. <laughs> mm. That's very nice. So how do you actually deal with your emotions if you lose a game? It could be really sad. Um, at the beginning, um, of course, it was very hard to control. <laughs> but after uh, uh, after I got more experience on playing the, playing the games, usually I will get up and then just walk around, drink some water, and just come down self, and then go back to the game. Okay, I'll let, I'll let my little goal player know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, do you think AlphaGo actually understands how to play Go? That's a tricky question. Um, I, I, I'll pitch in. So, I think the word understand is kind of misused here. Um, if, like, there, uh, well, like, define understand, right? So, if the 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 AlphaGo sees the game in a different way. It it has its own 
um, way to interpret va value and it has its own way to search for top moves. Um, but so in, in a way, it understands the game better than the top human players by a large margin because we don't really understand the game um, well enough to, to, to win against AlphaGo. But it can't explain the game, right? It, it can only show you some numbers or some, some, some yeah, some numbers, right? Uh, all machine learning is, is, is a bunch of numbers in, in matrices and they multiply them together and they make a decision. So it can't really explain the game, even though you could say it, it understands it, right? But a lot of our definition of understanding is if you can explain it to someone. I've heard that a lot, right? If you can explain something to someone, then you understand it. Mm -hmm. Then it doesn't understand the game. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Uh, here's another question. Who are some of your favorite more than Go players? Uh, who is my favorite modern Go players? Mm. Okay, the, the question is, how do we define modern? <laughs> okay, so for, uh, when I was learning um, Go, I, I studied a lot of Elise Edo's games. He was considered as a, the strongest modern uh, Go players because his style is quite different from the other elder uh, players. Uh, he's very attacking and um, looking for the most efficient move in, in a fight. Uh, so my style is more attacking side. So <laughs> um, yeah, Lee Seto is one of, yeah, it's my favorite Go player. Okay. How about Ryan? Yeah, um, I had a couple that I kind of follow recently, um, but I think one of the most, one of the Go players that made a big, the biggest impact on myself as a Go player is Go Sagan. Um, he um, he uh, was, was born Chinese, but uh, went to Japan to learn Go. Um, and uh, he lived to 100 um, and he, has been very revolutionary in his play. And he always challenged um, existing frameworks when, when he couldn't get good explanations. And he often succeeded, which led to changes in styles. And he had multiple uh, of these uh, stages where he would see a, a fixed style of play that was considered like the norm. And he would challenge it and he would try to change into a different style. And one of the things he said was that um, uh, playing, the same, playing the same way in Go is a sin. So he would, he would always try to change the way he plays. And he always, and as a result, he gave, um, he passed on a lot of these ideas who he, that he created and, and thoughts. And some of them didn't work, but some of them did. Um, so I, I've always thought, um, I've always learned a lot from from the way that way of thinking. Wonderful. So, okay, here's another question. By being pro, is there uh, money or bonus payment involved? <laughs> Any financial perks by being a pro here in North America? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in North America, it's not um, like an uh, an employment system. So the the AGA is a nonprofit institution. So you don't actually get paid for being a pro. However, um, you do get invited to the international tournaments, and you actually get to keep all your winnings if you win. Um, so that is a pretty big perk. Um, there's also events and, and invitations, and of course, there's the prestige. Um, which is different from uh, pros affiliated in, in, in Asia. Um, so those are more kind of, those are like more pro-pro, like that. So you kind of do it professionally and 
and get support. Maybe I, sh I shouldn't be talking about this. Stephanie should be okay. talking. Okay, it's okay. Um, another question is, you've said that human players has different styles. Does Avago also have styles of play? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure, actually. AlphaGo kind of plays against itself um, and has revealed quite a few games that it that it played itself in. <laughs> I, I guess the, the styles that AlphaGo has is always look for the, the most efficient move at that moment. If there is the 80% and 90%, uh, they always choose 90%. That's well, AlphaGo has a AlphaGo doesn't have a personality, right? So by <laughs> so it can't have a style. <laughs> it can't have a style. But now a lot of professional Go players are imitating AlphaGo's moves and the styles if there is one. So do you think AlphaGo, so before AlphaGo human Go players have their different, very characteristic styles. But after AlphaGo, uh, would all the human Go players playing the same way, the same style, just because there is kind of an answer key to that? Would that make Go less fun? For sure. In the beginning, um, it's because it's all very well-defined, right? In the opening, there are actually very fixed opening styles now that have been exposed that are generally more effective than others. So that actually did lead to um, some openings kind of almost being completely eliminated now by, by the top players. But I do think that in each game of Go, there is style. And as a, as a player, you always have to have a style because that's who you are almost. And it, it, it's really the way it's, it's like your starting points, the way you think, the way you make decisions. Um, so I think that even though the opening may be there are less style involved now, but I think that for each game as a whole, um, you have to expose some of your style. Right, yeah. Okay, can you give some suggestions and learning methods for newcomers and novice players? This is from a Go teacher in Chicago. Oh, okay. Um, mm. For a beginner and a novice, mm -hmm. um, I think at the beginning, because of the, the rules of Go is very, is, is simple. It only has the three rules and it's very easy to, to get started. And a lot of people, um, it, it, so there's a biggest difference between the youth players and the adult players. So uh, for the youth players, um, it's, it's more, they're more focused on capturing stones. So once they have a practice questions they do, they can get better um, step by step. But for the adult players, once they, they learn the rules, they want to start the game um, immediately, which it, the board is very big. And then if we haven't learned any opening strategies yet, it's hard for anyone to complete a game. So I think at the beginning, um, everyone should, um, should be patient and learn all the basic strategies first and then start some openings and then and then focus on playing the games. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Ryan. This is a great presentation. I, I really hope there could be opportunities in the future that we could work together to promote Go. Um, and then thanks everyone for coming. Our next webinar will be in February of 2023. Thank you everyone. Bye now.